I gave this talk, I think, like a month or so ago uh, um, in Bloomberg office or whatever that is in, uh, in a London. So it was completely kind of rewritten to kind of tackle some of the performance issues um, and, and kind of give you a, an overview of like some of the built-in APIs that are available that actually help us uh, with, with Angular performance. Um, <clears throat> right, so... This is called tuning the engine. Um, it kind of focuses on the engine part of Angular. So um, if you've been using it for some while, you probably have heard of the word digest with the dollar in front of it and all these other kind of things. So we're actually going to learn how the digest loop works, um, which was quite interesting, how Angular does dirty checking, all these other things. Uh, so talk overview. There's... Um, I've put up a, a performance course on courses.tobmato.com. Uh, it's completely free, um, which the entire course, there's loads of Angular APIs, like asynchronous stuff that will be in the performance course. Um, but these are like the main kind of features. The other stuff's kind of like down and dirty in the source code, et cetera. So you can go ahead and grab that. Um, what else we got? Understand the digest cycle. So that's kind of the next piece with the Angular event loop and how everything kind of works. And then performance tuning. So we can actually look at um, like problems. We call them problems, like slow ng repeats, for example. And we can look at ways to kind of speed them up. So uh, we'll start with the Angular event loop. I'll try and transition these a little bit slower just in case there's any browser lag. So everybody has a browser when the browser is kind of loaded up. This is the, the kind of illustration for how the kind of JavaScript uh, event loop and Angular kind of tie in together. So we have a browser, which is a nice pink box. And then if you kind of bind a, an, an event, such as a click event, that then gets pushed into the event queue. So we can have all these different kind of events, like click and change and focus. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then, so let's just assume that a click event fires and then JavaScript goes, oh, hey, now I need to do something. So it goes off to this JavaScript uh, execution context. Next, because the event is probably going to be bound inside Angular, for example, so in Angular we do ng click, ng change, ng focus, so we don't just set the the, the native DOM APIs, we, we use Angular's ng-prefix directives. Uh, these then go into um, what we call the, the, well, in a second comes into the digest. But beforehand, Angular basically calls it with an, an apply function, uh, which if you've been integrating sort of uh, like a jQuery plugin, for example, if you've built like a date picker directive, then you might have some kind of callback that you want to then um, publish the change somewhere else. So you'd have to run like a scope apply. So this is kind of a similar thing. So when we run, when Angular runs this apply, it passes in the function, which this function in the middle could be like a controller callback. This like a, like could be bound to an ng click. So it could be like update username or something like that. At this point, we move on to the next step, which is the digest loop, which is a kind of the murky waters that most of us don't really understand or didn't understand. So we're going to actually look at how the digest works. And then you go, oh, that was actually quite simple. So after Angular's basically ran our apply, it's called a function, then it goes into this digest loop. We then go back to the DOM. We can re-render. It can do all the model updates, et cetera, et cetera. Then it goes back to the event queue. And then you might have another click event or another focus event. So if you think about it, it's doing quite a lot of things in a very, very short space of time. And if you're using like a, an ng model, for example, on an input and you type five letters, it's doing all of this stuff within a split second between each other. So understanding this cycle will help you sort of understand and build faster Angular applications. So here's a real basic example. Um, I can start typing here which is probably the, the best hello world that you've probably done with AngularJS when you first started started with Angular. So we can just have an ng model on the input, and then we can pass in a specific property, and then we can call out this property here. So whatever we type in here, this whole cycle happens, and then every single time Angular goes and updates this piece. 
So we're going to work out, well, I'm not going to work out because I've already done that. So we're going to look at how, um, if I type here, how Angular does all its checking and then starts updating the HTML and a model underneath. So here's just a brief example of what it looks like. We've got ng model with title passed in, and then we're just using the interpolation braces for title just to call it out in the DOM. So ng model is, is the actual thing that does the two-way sort of data binding, whereas this, this guy here is just one-way data binding. So ng model will allow a user to change the data, but then the controller can actually change the data. So it's, it's two-way. So the user can provide input, but then the controller can also provide input, which if you've looked at like Angular 2, you get the different syntax. You get a square brace and then a, a normal bracket thing, number nine on your keyboard, I forget what it's called. Um, whereas the user can't really change what's in the span. So that's just one way data bind. It's just, it will just update it when it needs to. So it's, it's quite good to sort of make that distinction to begin with. So there's, a lot more that makes up the digest cycle. However, these are kind of the main components of the digest cycle. So we kind of need to understand root scope and scopes, and then the watchers, which is like a, a hidden thing. When you see things that are dollar dollar, that kind of indicates that it's a public property on a, an object or a scope. However, you're not really meant to use it. It could be a subject to change. So don't don't ever use anything that's dollar dollar prefixed. Um, but the watchers is essentially how Angular does all this dirty checking and the digest loop. Uh, what have we got? So we've got scope.watch as well. So this we've probably all used, and you hear things like, oh, scope.watch is bad. Um, if you understand what it does and how to use it, it's, it could be bad, it could be good. Uh, and then we've got the digest loop. So these, all, these things are like part of the cycle. And then we finish off with the loop. So let's start with root scope and scopes. These are purely like conceptual level things. So bear with me if you already know how these kind of things work, but it's good to just paint a picture. So when you bootstrap an Angular app, you have like ng app equals my application. Angular goes and bootstraps it. It will then create a root scope. And then let's say you had a controller or a component or something like that. Angular will then inherit off of this root scope and create a new scope. So we just have it's like a child sort of structure. So we have a root scope and inside that scope, we have another scope. And then, I don't know, 10 hours later, we've got all these other child scopes, which we end up with a massive application with all these different scopes and sibling scopes and parents and childs. So this is just a real basic example of how scopes are created. And if you can't sort of envision them, this is how you might do them when you actually declare things with AngularJS. So you might have ng app that would then go and create a root scope. This might be an ng controller, and these two could be ng repeats. So each of these is going to create a new scope. Um, ng repeat will obviously create the amount of scopes that you pass to the repeat. So if there's five items in the the repeat the repeat collection, you're going to get five different child scopes. Uh, if you want to make some notes, then feel free. Um, however, they, uh, I'll post the link to all the slides so you can grab them at the end. But obviously, if there's something that's written down that kind of catches your eye or that, that I kind of elaborate on, then do write that down or just post it in the Q&A piece and I'll elaborate on it and just clarify things afterwards. So these scopes are just objects that inherit from each other. Each scope that we create goes and then inherits off the parent. Um, if you create th sort of things like isolate directives, um, these kind of break this inheritance chain. Uh, we don't really need to know about that for how we understand how Angular actually works. So each of these scopes, so we just looked at like ng app, ng controller, ng repeat, all of those, I mean, if you've created an Angular application, you probably got a few hundred in a particular view or on the, the entire application. So each of those scopes has this thing called a watcher, which is dollar dollar prefix. You can access it. If you go inside your controller and do like console.log dollar scope, you can actually expand that object and you can see the watchers bound to that particular scope. So it's actually useful for debugging. So when we look at uh, the previous example and then actually illustrate it with watchers, at runtime, everything starts off as null. So we get absolutely nothing. 
And then as as things actually start to spring into life, Angular starts compiling things, all of these watchers that were null start to actually change into arrays of objects. So this dot, dot, dot in the center just implies that there's some content in the middle. So we have a parent scope with watchers with a bunch of uh, objects inside an array, the same for the child scope and then the next child scope. So just keep, in, just keep those in your memory that each, each scope has watchers with the objects inside. Uh, if you actually expand these, so if you did, um, if you go into like an existing ang Angular app and do console log scope or even console log scope dot watchers, you can actually see uh, an object uh, or an array of objects that like look like this, depending on what actually you've bound to the view or set up some kind of watcher. So we have a couple of functions. Uh, this guy, EQ, so this basically checks for object equality. So if you do scope.watch and then pass in the third argument as true, it will do like a deep watch. So you can actually, um, that kind of corresponds to this. By default, it's false. So if you want it true, you pass it in as a third item. We'll look at that as we get onto the scope.watch example. Um, and then we've got EXPR, which is an expression, and then function, new value, get, and then last, we'll actually come onto these, but this is basically what makes up each watcher. And if you've used scope.watch, you'll probably look at this function at the moment and say, ah, that looks a bit familiar. I can probably understand how that actually works or what it corresponds to. Uh, it's the second callback to scope.watch. And then this last property is the kind of important part with the whole dirty checking uh, process inside the digest cycle. So we all know this guy, which is scope.watch. So before we kind of actually dig in a little bit deeper, we'll understand what creates a watcher because there's no point in me explaining, oh yeah, Angular has all these watchers and it's got a load of objects inside, but you need to know what you're doing with Angular that actually creates these watchers. And then in turn, you can learn what actually is making up your application uh, and, your, and the whole digest cycle behind it. So you probably use um, like the controller as syntax. So instead of injecting scope, you'll be using like this dot name uh, instead of scope. However, if you need to use scope dot watch, you will need to inject dollar scope. So here, uh, here we inject scope dot watch, and I'm just going to look up a property called name, which obviously corresponds to here. When this name changes by any means, uh, it could be a backend response or the the user input we'll actually get this callback, which runs. So we'll get the new value followed by the old value. We probably don't want to use the old value, but we can do something with the new value. So this might actually look like this. So we have this watches objects because we've set up a scope.watch. Angular needs to actually keep track of what we've told it to watch. So it'll actually go and, um, it will go and get the value that we want to watch, which essentially corresponds to this piece here. So if you're passing in a string, Angular will actually convert it to a function. So what I like to do is just pass in a function instead of a string, and you can do function and then return scope.name. It's a bit more JavaScript-y rather than just using a string because nobody likes strings nowadays. Um, what else have we got? And then the... Uh, the oh, yeah, hang on. Let me go back. So this function here is basically this function here. Uh, and these properties are actually called these really short things. Um, so this is the function that gets ran when Angular uh, recognizes a change has been made. Um, this get function will go and get the initial value. So it will go and get the scope.name. Uh, this function will do the comparisons of, <coughs> excuse me, of whether it's changed or not and it will compare it to this last value. So if I decided to delete a D from the end of my name, Angular would go and reference this last property and basically compare it uh, against the last, against the current value, the new value. Um, if something has changed, it will then run this callback and then pass you the old value, which would be T-O-D-D, and then it will give you the new value of just T-O-D uh, if, if, yeah, if, if I've deleted a D from the end of my name, for example. 
what else creates uh, uh, watches? So view interpolation, this is a good thing to keep in mind. So when you create this kind of scope dot name, um, when I used to like, well, for about two years, I think I used to think that everything I just did like scope dot something, it was making it a public API. Therefore it would create um, some kind of watcher inside, which would then slow down my application. However, um, that's not actually true. So you can bind as much stuff to as you want to scope. It's it's the point where you actually bind it to the HTML that actually creates the watcher. So it's this guy here. So we have scope.name equals Todd. And then when we bind it, this is what creates the watcher because Angular needs to then know whether to update um, the actual HTML. Uh, same again, it will do the exact same functions, exact same checks. Um, however, the stuff that is in this function um, is kind of the the secret bit that we need to explore. So that function is where basically Angular will go and update the HTML, which obviously we're told do not do DOM manipulation in controllers, don't do it in watch and all this kind of thing. But when Angular has to do it itself. This is where all that kind of magic happens for the, the automatic DOM updates. So why is this important to know? Watchers are what drives Angular. Angular uses the watchers to update the DOM. It also uses the watchers to synchronize our model. And obviously, if you've added a ton of watchers to your application, probably without even knowing it, then they impact the performance. So you can you can think about these things as you start to develop the Angular applications so that you don't essentially overload this digest cycle. So if you think about the first diagram that we looked at where we've got root scopes and scopes and ng controller, <coughs> all these kind of things, and then each of those has a watchers and you're adding all this stuff to these watchers, it's, it's, after a while it's going to start to slow down uh, our applications. So back to this, listen closely. So if I type hello, there's a lot of stuff that's just happened and we're actually just gonna walk through. Um, I've actually made up the source code, uh, like a pretend watcher with a fake callback that updates the HTML and stuff that does this. Um, but this is basically what Angular will do in a nicer way underneath. So when you start typing, it obviously updates this thing here. So we have an input, and then we're just logging out the value. And this just uses ng model, and then we have a span. Now, for this example, um, all you need to remember in the next, because we basically look at how it kind of works theoretically. So we have an input and then a span tag. If you just remember those two things, then we're all good. So when we look at ng model, this is kind of how Angular would dynamically set up. Um, the watcher with an ng model. So let's assume that we just wanted to write it ourselves because we're feeling lazy and it's not part of the Angular framework. Uh, we can do var input and then we can get a, a DOM reference to the input node. Obviously, when you bind ng model to an input or a text area, Angular is automatically going to get a reference to that input. But for the sake of clarity and making it simple uh, to read, we're just going to use plain JavaScript for this stuff. Then we're going to set an event listener. We're going to use uh, the input event, which is, I think it covers like paste and other things. I think it's a newer uh, event listener. Um, then, so basically when I start typing, this function is uh, essentially going to get called because something has changed. The input event has fired. At this point, Angular is going to start calling this scope apply function, which inside, it says, oh, okay, I need to update scope.title um, with this.value. And this would then correspond to uh, the input. However, somebody's going to pick up and say that I didn't use bind on this guy uh, because the this value would actually apply to scope. So if you imagine that this, this is the function context here, I would change it after. Um, so. Uh, let's just run through that real quick. So we've got an input. When something changes, we have this function that's callback. Scope apply gets run. Then internally, Angular is going to get the value 
of the input and then it's going to set it to its internal model of scope.title. So that's how that piece works. And this is just one way data binding at the moment. So uh, let's look at how it kind of works with the two way. So we wanted to look at the title property. So we created uh, the curly braces that's inside the span tag. So Angular will automatically set up scope.watch with title. So it's going to go and look at title for us. And then we look to the watcher object and inside that we get we get this new value and the old value when something's changed so these watchers will basically execute this function here so because i'll just flick back to the the previous screen so if you look closely we've got scope apply which gets called because we need to tell angular to update itself scope.title has just been changed with the value therefore this scope.watch will then execute because scope.title has just been updated. And that's the property here that we're looking at. Now we're going to get the new value uh, that's been assigned to scope.title. And we can also access the old value if we want to. And then all we're going to do is update document query selector input dot value with the new value. And you might be thinking, so the input has just changed. And then we're going to set scope.title to the inputs value. Then we're going to have a watcher that's looking for this change on the title. And then we're going to set the inputs value back to the value that we just set. Now you might be thinking, well, why would we do that? So if the change didn't come from the user, we would then need to actually, so if, if the change came from inside the controller, for example, so if in the controller we did scope.title equals hello, we would then need to go and get this new value and then assign it to the input. So it does it back to the DOM from the controller. Uh, then we're going to have another watch because we, we have a watch inside the span tag. At the same time, this is going to fire. We're going to get the new value passed in. And then, as I said before, all you need to keep note of is the input and the span. And we're just going to set the inner HTML as new value. So every time the title property is changed, we're going to have these couple of watchers that one updates the value of the input itself. And then two, it's going to update the inner HTML of the span tag. Uh, if anybody wants that clarifying afterwards, then let me know. So this is just a basic example of the previous slide, how it might actually look inside the watchers. So when we set up um, like an NG model and then the interpolation curly braces in the HTML, so we have curly, title, curly, um, this will automatically be created or something similar to this will be created by AngularJS. Um, so here it's going to go and get scope.title so it knows what property to look for when something has changed. Then it's going to compare it to the last value. Uh, it will do that inside the expr function. We don't really need to look to look at this one. Uh, if something has changed, then it's going to run this function. It's going to update. Uh, it's going to pass in the new value. It's going to update the input. And then similarly, it's going to move on to this next next object which will then run the function again, pass new value, and then bind it, uh, pass it into inner HTML of the span tag. <clears throat> and if you think all of these different scopes have all these watchers, which are just arrays, and all the digest cycle does is essentially start at the first scope. If there's any watchers, it will just do a for loop over them. It will execute the functions, do a quick check. If nothing's changed, it will just move on to the next object. If something has changed, uh, it will then go and update the DOM. And most of the time, Angular will actually do two digest cycles. So if you imagine uh, this one, something has changed. But then in the first example, something hasn't changed. If we've already looped over this one, but then this second one changes something that this other piece of like a watcher relies on. We need to then go and loop all the way back through again just to make sure that everything is updated. So I've actually got like a, a flow of how this actually works. Let me zoom in a bit. 
of pink. Cool. So we have our Angular app, the user types inside the input. This is just the, the flow of how things work. Scope.title is updated with the input's value. Scope apply is executed, and then digest cycle commences. Then inside the digest cycle, or the digest loop, uh, Angular will run the get function, goes and gets the latest value, so scope.title, for example. Then it will compare the value to the last property. If it's different, it will execute the function property, and then it will continue to the next watcher, like I've just said. So we had two in two watches in the previous uh, example. Then it will continue uh, until it's clean. Then it will rerun the digest cycle most of the time. If you use it on like an input, it sometimes just runs it once. Um, if it's clean before, it doesn't like loop twice. If it's clean and nothing's changed, um, to it, so it basically loops again just to make sure everything's synchronized. Now on to uh, the performance tuning piece. So they're kind of there's a there's one more technique which isn't in this slide deck that I want to put. Um, no, that is um, in the, the free performance course. So um, if you check out the, I'll provide the link in the, the Q&A section, but if you check that out at the end, there's actually um, a huge list of videos that you'll be able to get for free if you, I'm still building uh, the previous course at the moment, um, but that'll be out in like a month or so. Um, cool. So yeah, it kind of dives a lot deeper into this nitty gritty digest stuff so we can actually build super fast things. So we'll start off nice and simple with interpolation. So Angular evaluates the entire text content. Um, if you, you'll notice I used a span tag in the previous example, so I'll just explain why, and you'll see why in a second. So let's assume we had this. Uh, we have hello and then some curly braces. So this could be hello Todd and welcome to Facebook. Now, every time something changes with this watcher, Angular has to set the entire text content again, which it's it's not a massive overhead to just set inner HTML as a simple string, but if you can just isolate it to this single piece, then it makes Angular's life a little bit easier. If you've got a hundred of these, you're gonna save a few milliseconds off your digest loops. So this is like a, a before consideration. So we, we could have a massive paragraph with just one of these in the middle that we might customize. So this is just a real brief example. Um, what we could do instead is say, hello, and then we can use a span tag with ng bind, and we can just pass in the name. And these two are essentially equivalents. So not only are we not looking at the entire text content and resetting it again, uh, ng-bind, there's, there's a, if you Google like ng-bind performance, there's a, a blog and it's actually slightly quicker to execute because it doesn't have to do all these other checks um, that the, the curly brace interpolation does. So this is a little bit quicker, but it also doesn't execute the entire text content. If you do want to use the curly braces, then you can use what I did before in the previous example. So we just had a span tag um, with just uh, the curly braces inside. So it will actually just look at the parent element, which would be the span tag, and it would say span HTML equals, and then the same. So it, it's pretty much the same effect. Uh, I prefer ng-bind just because it's a little bit more consistent, like ng-repeat, ng-click, ng-bind. It kind of fits in with the same kind of uh, directive prefixes. There are times when this is a little bit nicer, um, but it's it's usually a case by case basis. So this is another one. Uh, obviously, we looked at the the input, and when you start typing things, that whole digest loop. And if you imagine that we covered a lot of stuff with the the get function, the expression, the equals, and the last property, where it does all this checking, all of that is happening every single keystroke for an ng model. So we can use. Um, uh, we can use a, a built-in Angular API, which is kind of a, a API directive, which allows us to control the frequency of the digests on like an input, for example. Uh, if you haven't used it yet, this is called ng, <coughs> ng model options. 
So we just simply pass in an object here and we can say, I want to tell Angular to update on specific events because at the moment, Angular will just run a digest, uh, every single keystroke on blur events, paste events. So you can actually tell Angular to ignore particular events or just update the model on particular events. So if you were, if you were for example, um, if you create a new repository on GitHub, um, when you it does that little spinny and then it does a green tick if the if the repo name hasn't been taken, um, you could you could check perhaps on Blur event you could then send a request to the back uh, to the back end on Blur to then check if the, um, if the API uh, the repo name wasn't available or was available. So we can just pass in the events here. Default essentially is just typing. So if you start pressing keys, that is what default means. There's no point then putting key down, key up, and all the other things in there. So they just kind of sit under this default keyword. If you do a little JS fiddle or JS bin or something and just use this and actually start removing the different types of events, um, then have like a another watcher underneath where you, you might log out vm.model, for example. Uh, sort of underneath this, and you can actually start typing in the ng model, and then see when you blur the input that it actually updates when you tell it to. And when you tell it to depends on this debounce. So again, this is just an object. And the cool thing about this is we can actually tell it to debounce with different values. So when you start typing, um, we might say 250 milliseconds after the user has finished typing. We then want to update the model because otherwise it's just going to update at every single keystroke, which is a pain on performance. On Blur, we can say we want to update the model immediately, which kind of makes sense. We can then make a backend request, come back with an error response or a success response. So this is really, really powerful. Um, I'd probably use it on every single NG model unless it's very, very infrequently used or you actually need to. Um, use it on every single keystroke. But essentially, adding a debounce will allow you to stop the digest cycle and then tell Angular when to do the digest cycle. So that's a pretty good solution to to keeping things like a lot quicker. Like if you think about Google Mail, for example, you've got that search bar at the top. Now, if that was bound with an ng model, and then you had your list of emails that were, I don't know, a thousand watchers in total because you've got so much data and so many emails every time you're going to type something in the input it's going to have to loop through all of those emails and do all the dirty checking that we just looked at so if you can stop it um before it even does that and then only do it when you need to then it makes much more sense because if you've if you've had like a large data set and then you started typing in an input before you'll actually see some kind of lag before the the, the input value is updated, and that's because Angular updates it through the watches. Uh, so it has to loop, th loop through them all first. Uh, what else we got? Slower ng repeats. So these kind of give these three things. They can stall the application thread. They're probably the worst kind of candidate for slow Angular applications is the ng repeat because it's so powerful. It gives you so much, but then it kind of has the worst impact on performance. So we can we can have a look at things to do a little bit better. Uh, it can give a bad end, end user experience, like we just mentioned, when you start typing, and then it has to loop through all the ng repeats to just check things. Uh, and then once uh, I actually managed to crash my application, so don't do that. So this is how we can we can do things if um, if we want to add some some sort of performance gains to our RNG repeats. So we everything that we just looked at involved these watches. Now what happens if when you've rendered something, it would be good. To remove the watcher, wouldn't it? Because if, if it's like a page title or a view title that's dynamically served, you might want to then unbind it because you don't need to update it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we can use this one one-time binding syntax, which is literally just two colons before the expression itself. So if you've got uh, like a navigation, for example, like home, 
um, dashboard, log out, or something like that. We can actually use this one-time bindings and say, I want to statically render the items collection, which could be a navigation, it could be a list of emails, it could be absolutely anything. So this will actually fix the ng repeat itself. So if you then did scope.items equals a new collection, the entire thing would not change. It would be unbound, Angular doesn't know it exists anymore. Now, what it does know, um, because ng-repeat creates new scope, this item guy inside is still alive. Inside here, we can basically kill it off if we wanted to. We can say, okay, I want to use dot dot on item. So you can mix and match them depending on what you want to do. So a use case for this, um, if you take this example, this could be a list of emails. So we want to keep the items, which could be emails, we might want to keep that alive, but then we can just unbind the watcher associated with, with, with what's inside the email. So when you, if somebody sends me an email, the subject of the email, their name and the little intro piece of text aren't actually going to change because you can't just change an email that you've already sent. So it makes complete sense to just one time statically bind it, which Angular will go and get all the watchers associated with it, like a subject, who it's to, uh, who it's from, the subject, and then just completely annihilate it from Angular. So it doesn't exist anymore. If scope.items changed, so if I had a new email that just came into the inbox, it would then go and re-render um, re -render the repeat and add that new item in. So these are really good. You can use them with like other expressions. You don't have to use them um, with just ng repeat. Uh, you can use them on like ng class, uh, ng if, ng show, all those kind of things. Most of the things that take an Angular expression, you can use a one-time bind on. Um, this is really cool. This is this is kind of like DOM performance rather than pure Angular performance, but it's it's interesting to know. So, like in the previous example, if I had a, a ton of emails and uh, let's say I had a thousand and somebody sent me a new email, I would then have a thousand and one, at which point Angular would destroy all 1000 of those DOM nodes and basically recreate 1001 DOM nodes. Now that's kind of counterproductive and it doesn't really make sense to do. So we can control this. Uh, let's have a look. So we can control it with this track by. If you've already used track by, um, you one might be using it but don't know what it does, or you just kind of use it because you heard it speeds up your app. Um, but we can actually understand why we use it. So if you like a list of emails is a really good example for most of these concepts because it, it changes and we can click on them and update. So let's assume this is a list of emails. Uh, if I want to use track by. Um, if you have used track by, you might do track by dollar index. Um, essentially, we can give Angular a unique key. So if my particular email had an ID property, this one here, ID of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, they are all unique IDs. We can then tell Angular to associate the DOM nodes and the data with the particular ID. So it doesn't have to, Angular doesn't have to go and create its own. And by creating its own, it can't really manage the state of what needs to be created and destroyed. So when we use track by, if we had a thousand emails and um, I had one new, in, one new email come in the inbox to make it a thousand and one, Angular would just say, okay, I, all of these don't need destroying. I'm just going to create one DOM node and it will just append it rather than destroy and re-render the entire thing. So it would just append it to this UL and we'll get one new email at the top. This one's really interesting, slow DOM filters. So filters, uh, if, you, if you've used a, a filter on an ng-repeat, then you'll never do it again. Um, filters, uh, when you use them in the DOM, so I've put DOM filters specifically, um, they actually run twice per digest cycle, which if 
for example, we have an input, then an ng repeat with a filter on the input, uh, with a filter on the ng repeat. We're doing all these digest loops, and then we're looping twice over every single filter that's bound to the ng repeat, which already sounds like a lot of work for Angular to do. So here's how we can we can fix these kind of problems. Um, if you've used them um, in the HTML, you will probably have done something like this, and then used a pipe, and then you can do my filter and then prop prop being any kind of property that you want to use. So here is this is just a completely made up um, function uh, controller. Here I'm passing in the filter service. So anything that you create with Angular.module.filter, um, so you can create your own custom filters. You can you can access with this filter uh, API. Also anything that is built into Angular. So you can do uppercase or these kind of date filters. You can all access these via a string lookup uh, inside dollar filter. So let's assume that I have a button at the top of my page, which um, usually I give like a, the alphabet. So I might have a list of names a, and then the alphabet at the top. And if I click on A, I want to show only the people whose name begins with A. Now, if you do that in the DOM, it's very easy to do because you can just assign like a scope property and pass it into the, the DOM filter, um, but it's horrendous on performance. So this is the kind of way that we could do it um, without that. So let's say we had an onClick function. I just named it onClick. You can call it whatever you want for uh, your app. So this onClick function might be bound to every single object, uh, every single alphabet letter. So when the letter A is clicked, for example, we could have prop, which gets passed into the function. This could be A, and this gets passed into our uh, DOM filter. The collection will then um, get passed, and then my filter might do something majestic. Uh, and we can do the filter based on the collection that we pass in and then the property. So if you pass in uh, the letter A, you can then do all the filtering check, return um, the collection with just the people who have a name beginning with A. Um, so why might you want to do this as well? <clears throat> so not only do the DOM filters run twice every single digest uh, when you're using them in the HTML with a pipe, um, you, with this method, you can they they don't run unless they're called. So if you had this on site on an ng repeat where you can put the pipe and then my filter and then prop every single time um, the digest cycle runs angular will run the filter on the whole ng repeat which even if the data hasn't changed is a complete waste of time and resources and speed and performance the whole lot um, for angular to do so if we move it inside the controller we only want to update the collection with the filter on click. So there's no point having an input box, some random place in our application, and then the user starts typing. And then under the hood, Angular is actually looping through our ng repeat and running filter checks because those two events are possibly not tied together. So by explicitly saying, I want to only update my filters on click, we completely reduce the amount of overhead that Angular is doing. And we make it, make it, I actually prefer it this way because you just do everything in as JavaScript functions. You're not relying on all this sort of parsing magic uh, in the HTML from Angular. So that that's like a really good one. If you, um, I'll share the blog post. I actually did like a performance uh, article which basically illustrates how many digests get called by forcing digest cycles and then doing a check. Uh, it, using the same setup but with a filter and a controller and the differences are, are absolutely huge so i'll post that afterwards as well uh right let's move on to another one. this is not necessarily a pain point that we've experienced but from what we've just learned about like digest cycles this happens so if you use dollar http uh, let's assume you have like four api responses each 
one of those API responses will come back and then Angular will call a digest cycle. So how can we make this a little bit cooler? This one's nice and easy. You don't need to actually think too hard about it. So if you angular.module pass in a config function, you can just simply pass in this HTTP provider um, and then just call the method use apply a sync. Now what this does, uh, I haven't actually tested how it works like underneath in the source code. I just kind of trust that it works because it says it in the Angular docs. Um, but what it does, if you if you check out the documentation, any uh, API responses that resolve within around 10 milliseconds of each other. So if, if for instance, you're, you've got like a search API that you go off to, I don't know, a hundred different providers and you're waiting for results back. Um, each result that comes back will force a digest loop. Whereas if you've got a lot of them that are coming back within around 10 milliseconds of each other, uh, Angular actually puts these into an async queue, uh, which is also part of the digest loop. And once those, um, once that, next digest has finished angular will then go and flush that async queue so if you've got 100 api requests and 20 of them decided to come back within 10 milliseconds of each other they would be inside an async queue um, there would be some kind of digest happening or on the next digest cycle angular will go and flush those out first so it will get rid of the async queue which turns 20 digest cycles into one so that's a really nice performance thing which is just one line of code and super simple. Skip that one. Uh, this internal uh, DI means uh, dependency injection, if you don't know what DI means. Um, we'll look at what DI means if you don't know what DI means in a second. So internal dependency injection compile speeds. So this is quite interesting as well. So I've put here that we expect too much from Angular just out of the box. Like you can you can probably create any kind of framework and create an app with it with any kind of framework that's slow, but it's it's probably easier to create a slow Angular app than it is any other app because you can, kind of don't <laughs> you don't understand how it works. So by knowing about these watchers and the loops and all these kind of things, we can actually paint a picture in our heads when you start building more and go, oh, okay, I, maybe I don't want to add a DOM filter because that's going to thrash my application. So, uh, right, let's get onto the dependency injection stuff. So when we create a controller, um, we need to pass in things like scope and timeout, and then we can use them inside, like that's a no brainer. Um, however, when our app gets minified, scope might become A and then timeout might become B. So what we do to basically protect that is we do some service dot inject, uh, I don't know why I've just injected scope into a service because you can't do that. Never mind. <laughs> Pretend it's something else. <laughs> this one's not scope. Um, so we have scope here, and then we basically put them inside strings because you can't minify a string, so it keeps the the actual reference to dollar timeout. So then it can then compress the source code, uh, and it will map the arguments across. So scope will get mapped across if this becomes a timeout will get maps across if timeout here becomes B. Now you might think, okay, what what about it? Like, why? So you can use this thing called ng-strict-di, which basically tells Angular to run in strict mode. It's kind of similar to like JavaScript strict mode. It just kind of picks up on things that you, you should be doing. Um, however, it's like Angular specific. So it will basically throw an error for anything that you haven't annotated um, so here I'm, I've annotated it with dollar inject and then an array of dependencies. Um, if you haven't done that with ng strict di, it's just going to throw an error at you. Now this is a good practice to do this because if I go back, I've put the, the pain point was the internal compile speeds. So I actually looked at the source code of how angular recognizes how to actually put scope and timeout in here like ignore the fact that we put inject and all these other uh, things down here um so essentially what that does angular converts the function that we pass in uh to a string it will then do a regular expression it will go and basically get everything between 
uh, these little bars here, the little braces. So it will essentially then uh, do a, a white space replacement. So it will get rid of this like space here. Then it will do some other little calculations, uh, gets rid of comments if you put a comment in there. And then it will basically split all the function arguments by a comma. So you, you basically just get a list of that. So Angular will go and turn this into this for you, which if you go on Stack Overflow, people complain about uh, regular expressions being super slow. So Angular will do like four or five regular expression checks per function that you've annotated, which if you've got loads of them, that's a lot of wasted time and kind of processing. Um, from looking at the source code, if you use inject, that's like the fastest way to do things. Um, Angular will literally just take the array and then go and compile it. It will m map it straight across to this. Um, if you use this syntax where you do, um, like dot factory, for example, and then pass in a couple of string arguments. And then the last argument of the array is a function. Uh, Angular actually removes this function from the array uh, keeps a track keeps a variable stash of it somewhere else so you just basically if you remove some service you just basically end up with this so it's just got to go through one extra step which if you've got like a thousand different array annotations that's like a thousand um, javascript array manipulations which could just be saved if you just use inject so that's that's like my preferred method from just reading the source and just looking at how it actually works Needless watchers uh, from directives. So uh, somebody mentioned earlier about ng-if and ng-switch and ng-show and ng-hide. I'm out of breath. <laughs> um, right. So these are actually quite simple. They're basically, if you don't open Chrome DevTools, ng-if and ng-show do the exact same thing. If you open Chrome DevTools and look at the element that's being ng-ifed, then there's a lot. Um, that's actually happening. So if you, we'll start with ng-show because that's probably like one of the first things you use with Angular. If you use ng-show, pass it an expression, that'll be true or false or truthy or falsy. This gets evaluated. Uh, Angular will then go and add a class to this element that says class equals ng-hide, which Angular injects a load of styles at runtime, which ng-hide has display none, uh, important. So you, it basically just, makes it invisible for the DOM, which I've got this LI inside with um, an ng repeat inside. So if you think vm.menus, if there's a thousand items in that vm.menus array, they are they are just being hidden from the DOM. They, um, they still exist. So every single digest cycle, Angular will go and check this ng show. If it's still false, then it's gonna keep the DOM element hidden. Even if it is hidden, it's going to still go and loop through all of these things, which is a complete waste of time. Um, so that's when ng-if comes in. So we can say ng-if, and then just pass in the exact same expression that we do with like ng-show. However, if ng-if is false, Angular will actually destroy the entire thing, remove it from the DOM, remove it from the watchers. Um, it will basically just destroy everything until it's it's like truthy again. So if ng if is true, this guy gets destroyed. Then ng uh, then the ng repeat with the li inside gets destroyed as well, and all the data associated with it. So we're not just pointlessly looping over all these things, um, even though that it's hidden. Now, depending on what you want to do with this and how frequently something is used, then it's purely like a case by case basis. So there might be an instance where you might have an a list with a bunch of stuff inside, but then ng show is the better option. And that might be because recreating and destroying the DOM is a quite expensive, but then a digest cycle is expensive as well. So it, it, if, a, if the ng if is being used very frequently, we don't want to keep like thrashing the DOM and just destroying it and recreating it every single click, for example, uh, if we were just toggling a value. So ng show might be a, a better one to choose uh, in that case. Uh, 
extra DOM querying and processing. This is a really cool one. Um, I think it was about a year and a half ago I found out this. Um, there was a blog that basically did some weird jQuery stuff. It did the check for jQuery something or other, um, which essentially adds all this extra data to your Angular apps at runtime. So if you've ever, like, well, you probably have, if you've built with Angular, you do an inspect element on a particular div or whatever, and then you'll see, like, class equals ng controller space ng scope and all these ng binding and all these other class names that Angular adds. Now, if you basically, again, this is just a simple one-liner, you use config, this is just the function up here, we can pass in this compile provider and we can call debug info enabled false. I don't know why they don't just get rid of false and just debug disable or something, make it a bit more obvious. Um, so what does this actually do? If you put this in your Angular app and then inspect the DOM, you're not going to have any class names um, bound to all of your elements. So there'd be like no class equals ng binding or ng controller, ng scape, all those kind of things. I mean, that's kind of a, a small performance gain in itself. So you're not just kind of, Angular's not just adding all these classes to potentially thousands of elements uh, at runtime. But there's also one other thing that this does. So if you've ever started debugging Angular um, in the Chrome DevTools, you, you do like, um, you can query a particular element and you can call dot scope or get isolate scope or all these other methods that you can basically grab a raw DOM element and access the scope bound to it. And, and Angular basically binds all the scope data to each individual scope element uh, at runtime whilst it does all this add class, all these ng binding classes as well. So we can basically tell it not to bind all this data. Um, that, so you basically can't do dot scope and basically fetch all this hidden data associated with it. Now you only need those pieces of data when you're running like unit tests or end-to-end -end tests. So that's when Angular needs them because it will basically use um, like the data associated with a scope like if you've tested like a directive, for example, you can do like dollar compile and then, um, oh, what was it? I think it's get isolate scope or I dot isolate scope or something like that, that you can basically fetch the information and then run the test. So it basically disables all of that. You obviously don't want to disable it when you're running tests. Um, so you can conditionally print that out or however you want to do it. So this is basically the DOM change that it does uh, if you haven't seen it yet. So here we have our ng controller. Doesn't matter what the controller is called, but we'll get this ng scope and then ng binding. And then I've got a directive here, which you can assume uses like isolate bindings. So it's going to add a class ng isolate scope. Um, they look really cool. Not really. And then if you disable it, you basically just get nice clean DOM, so you don't get all this class stuff added everywhere. Um, and if you're thinking um, that you need these classes for forms, they're slightly differently because you use like ng pristine and all that kind of thing. But they're not like debug info, so they're safe to just enable because you can use the the form classes for styling purposes. Like if it's an error, you can make it red. So they're they're kind of separate. So. Um, that's kind of a glimpse. If there was loads of questions, you can put them in the box in the middle. Um, I think there's probably there's probably like ten percent of the stuff that the performance course is going to cover. There's there's literally loads of stuff in there, um, and it kind of dives into the crazy stuff that you probably never even seen, or sometimes I haven't even seen until I've actually like viewed source. Um, so yeah, you can grab that. Um, I'll post the link and then that that's free to basically order. Uh, I'm still building it at the moment, so you can grab it and then you'll get an email as soon as it's out. So yeah, um, I will pass back to oh, you, Peter. Yeah. Stay, stay on, stay on the line, Todd. You, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good news. Um, yeah. Tell everyone about what you're uh, going to be doing, what this is, uh, you know, 
why the reason why I brought you on. Hang on, let me get rid of my weird Inception screen sharing. Yeah, that's probably better. <clears throat> there we go. Yo. Oh, back in the real world. You you can breathe now. Yeah, I'll I'll paste the link in the um uh There we go. Unless it just goes up like that. You call. Cool. Yeah, so Todd is going to be doing some great courses <laughs> on this. So uh, hopefully he has wet your appetite um, already. Um, let's literally just take very quick five minutes. Yeah, just to answer a couple of the questions that mm -hmm. are the most pressing ones. Yeah. Um, someone, oh, a few people actually have asked, uh, what tools would you recommend for measuring this performance that aren't the dev tools? Is there anything that jumps out? Um, I, I did say I would post uh, an article that I've previously written, which, oh, okay. which basically it does one aspect. So I just put my leg up on a chair and crouched forward for like <laughs> three hours, um, which basically looks at um, the digest impacts of the, the filter thing. So that's, that's one piece which you can read in your own time. I'll paste that afterwards. Um, there's also, um, I'll actually write the comments. Uh, where is it? Any recommended tools? <clears throat> yeah, somebody's already put uh, AngularJS Batarang. So you can basically, each of those scopes, like we looked at at the beginning, um, where they're all pink and then they have child scopes inside. Um, oh, man, there's loads of questions. Yeah, no, one of, the, one of the, I'm just picking the ones that were the most popular. Um, one I saw lots of people mention in the channel was, uh, mm -hmm. does going to Angular 1.5 just give an easy win for some of this stuff? Um. Oh man. So there, there's basically a huge change in Angular 1.5. Um, uh, let me finish the the perform uh, the non Chrome DevTools thing first. So there's basically a, a module called ng stats. I'll type it in the sidebar if you're listening and want to read it real quick. Um, that's made by Kent uh, C Dodds. So that's really cool. You can either include it as like a JavaScript file, or you can just get the code, paste it in the Chrome DevTools, and it will like put a little box in the top of top left of your app. Obviously, it's just for like debugging, um, but it essentially tell you how fast your digest speed is in milliseconds and how many watches you've got on the page. Yeah, thank you, Sean, for posting that, um, which is is really handy. And then I've got um, the article which I'll post afterwards, which is like a it basically counts how many digest cycles have occurred. So if you're maybe like if you've got a scroll event or something that you're whizzing down the page. Um, I can't remember somebody tweeted or emailed me the other day saying that they had a scroll event or something that was being hammered, um, forcing like a digest loop, I think. Um, so you can, you can essentially look at um, how frequently the digests are getting called. So yeah, that's in the article. I'll post that afterwards. Uh, what was the, oh yeah, let's move on to the 1.5. Yeah, yeah. So from 1.3, 1 there was like, I haven't got the exact stats. It's in another slide deck of mine. Um, the, the, the digest cycles basically faster from version to version. So they, they basically, um, from 1.2 to 1.3, they basically drop support for like IE7, um, IE8. So you don't, it, they just remove a load of legacy support code. Um, and then there's, um, I think it was like 70, no, maybe not seventy. Like, I'll have a look after. It. There was like, there was a huge amount of um, like garbage collection that Angular goes and redoes. Um, but the one of the main changes in Angular one point five, which is like a crucial step right now, um, is the like using dot component. And I'll type this in here. Um, name dot components. Like, um, I actually. If you're on Angular 1.3, I spent like 10 hours writing a polyfill, which basically polyfills the component method back to Angular 1.3, so you can yeah. use you can use components now. Um, but the the change that that brought essentially um, gives you one way data binding rather than two way, because let's say you have a component, everybody watch component, and then a component you pass data from this component to this component. If this component then updates a piece of data, um, it will basically just update both of them. So 
uh, what you do with dot component, uh, you essentially use a new syntax, which uh, instead of so like where you if you everybody listening watching the sidebar, so instead of doing scope and then like doing scope um, and then prop and then using two a data binding, which is is that guy. Well, there's this, and then there's also this uh, for other things that are juicy. Um, we have the new one, which is just the left arrow, which says one-way data binding. Um, so this basically, uh, if you look in the source code, because I had to look in the source code to basically write the polyfill for it, it sets a watcher on the parent, and then when the parent changes, it passes the... Um, the object, the change object, down to the local controller, um, but then it doesn't it doesn't propagate back up to the parent if the local property updates it. So that that's a huge change. Um, there's also all the lifecycle hooks. So this is like uh, I know Alan just put component in sugar. So it is kind of sugar, but then it's got a ton of new features which kind of give you a completely new way of building um angular apps so you have these um on init you have all these life cycle uh, all these life cycle hooks like yeah that's what they call them life cycle hooks so yeah it's on destroy and then there's post link as well uh that one yeah, component has mounted React, yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, you have all these different hooks for different parts of the lifecycle. So on init, obviously, gets called on initialization of the, the controller um, or the, the component that it's bound to. And then on changes, you'll want to use when something happens from the parent. So something flows down into the child component, on changes gets called with the, the new change object, which you can then rebind. Um which encourages this kind of one-way data flow. So I'll try and let me just grab a, a JS fiddle. I, I pasted it like right at the beginning, but then it got lost in everyone's comments. Right, there we go. I think this is it. So if you check out the, the JS fiddle that I just posted, um, then this essentially gives you the how to build with the the one one way data flow. So oh man, I'm trying to read questions and talk at the same time. Um, so you essentially have a, a parent property, a parent or parent component which passes a, a property down. You then clone, um, like you treat the property as immutable. You clone the property that's passed down, reassign it to a local component scope. Then you can mutate the clone. And then using an event, like an Angular 2, you then pass it back up to the parent scope. So you're not doing this whole two-way data binding thing. Um, so you can use one-way data flow, which is, is much, much better. Cool. I just want to answer one question myself, actually, just because I've seen oh. so many people asking it. Um, no, this is an easy question about the recording or the replay. Uh, so as far as I understand it, when this is finished, which will be in a few short minutes, um, you'll be able to re hit refresh on this, and I believe it will let you replay straight away. I could be wrong. Uh, if I am wrong, we'll be getting the recording. We will be putting it, uh, you know, editing the uh, the errors we had on the beginning, uh, technical snafus that we had off at uh, the beginning, and uh, putting it somewhere so that we can email you and let you know all about it. So also in that email, we'll also let you know um, any links that Todd wants to include, because there's a few things he's linked to that, you know, he'd like you to check out, stuff like that. Um, and we're also going to link to a sign up for our next session, which is going to be um, you missed this in the chat, Todd, but uh, next week is a session about React and D3. So, yeah, no one knows what React is in here, um, I'm guessing. But, uh, yeah, it's quite it's quite popular nowadays, apparently. So no, um, we'll be doing that one next week. But I mean, if there's any questions you can see on here, I mean, obviously, the point of this is, you know, people can reach out to you and they can come up, you know, look at your course and get in touch with you that way. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, if. If there are any questions here that just jump out at you, like, I oh, really should answer that before we go, feel free to take it. But uh, other than that, you know, it's been a great session and, uh, you know, really appreciate you coming on. And, of course, all the people who are attending as well. Yeah, um, I think there's a billion questions. Uh, yeah, I don't fix know. that nice and quick. 
Yeah, I don't know how much time you've got. I don't mind. Sort of. Well, no, I've got, I've, I've got to go, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, I mean, no. technically, technically, I can actually leave this, but uh, I don't know what it would descend into. It may t- descend into something pretty evil. I don't know. Uh, I, I would be late home. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was, should I reduce the amount of directives slash components for Perth? Um, no. <laughs> no, I don't. I kind of treat it a little bit differently with 1.5, like 1.5.5 and above. There were some weird changes, which the API wasn't totally consistent in 1.1, 2, and 3. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, we're essentially with um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say now. Oh yeah, with the, with the one-way data flow, um, then it kind of doesn't make too much difference. Like if you want to refactor a directive to a component as well, then by all means do that. Um, Whatever you do, don't just refactor a directive to a component because that's not how it works. (laughs) Um, A directive is essentially for binding to existing DOM or existing HTML. So you could have um, like a, a div or let's just take an A tag, and then you bind a directive called ng click. So that's adding to an existing element, whereas a component should declare templates and have like behavioral things to them, it's like a controller. Um, you can have smart and dumb components, like uh, or presentation or container components. Um, so you can just pass the properties um, to a component, or you can have them like stateful so they can actually have uh like controllers and functions and all these other things um so yeah there's a if you want a better explanation then tweet me and i'll write something up actually no i wrote a massive gist the other day on this hold on two seconds i'm still here by the way but uh yeah i switched machines because that other machine the audio wasn't working so now on a laptop and the battery is getting attacked big time yeah, there you go. If everyone clicks on that um, gist, I basically wrote, I, I will write an article on this, but it was just annoying me before I went to bed, so I had to write about it. Um, so yeah, this kind of gives you the the examples. And there's a lot of people that I've spoken to who are just like refactoring directives into components, even though that they're like um, behavioral or view, like binding directives. So you're, there's something that you add to an existing element um, you have got this thing called post link in components, but I would generally avoid that because you you sh- you shouldn't really need to do it. If the only um, like use case I can probably think of with using post link, um, if you had a component that inside had a, a UL, for example, which had an ng repeat inside, you might in the post link might want to do a document query selector all and then go and fetch all the LIs, whereas you can't really do that with a, a directive that's like bound to each LI because they're going to be in a different scope and you can't really do like dot .parent, uh, this dot .parent node query selector all in each individual directive scope. So that kind of sucks. Um, so yeah, post links not for like just copying and pasting a directive and pasting it in post link because the, the two are completely different design concepts. So any directives that have like controllers, um, service interactions and and templates, those are the ones that go into dot component. Whereas the old ones are just um, directives that you bind to an existing template. They, they should remain as directives. Uh, That's basically how it, how it will work in angular two as well. Uh, Same with the angular 1.5, like data flow stuff when you pass things down and then, pass an event back up with the data that's been modified that's the exact same pattern in angular 2 and and in react so and i think ember now you pass props and stuff like that um what else we got have dormant oh man everyone's keep typing yeah i'm gonna get everyone to follow you on twitter yeah Need some need more followers than JavaScript Weekly. <laughs> two hundred billion that you've got. Ah uh, no, only two hundred thousand. Only. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the size of our country. 
Um, for components that have to do DOM interactions, we abstracted them into attribute directives that get sued in conjunction with the component. Send me a, like a JS fiddle or something and I'll take a look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ping me, a, ping me a link on Twitter because I don't know if this chat thing dies as soon as we leave that. Cool. Um, what else we got? Jeez. Hang on, let me look at the the main thread. What we got? Is a give me a shout, by the way, Peter, when you you're out of time. Um, well, technically, this will this will cut off at ninety minutes as well, so it's a limitation of uh, crowdcast. So we're at eighty one minutes now, so uh, it will wrap up itself at some point. So just to warn you. Okay. Yeah, let me. Um, I I won't just ignore all these comments. I'll. Um, I'll just type the answers out for the ones that we don't cover. <clears throat> Features that like change. Component reactions. Yeah, some of these are quite long. How to deal with ng repeating long lists with complex directives. Um there's okay <clears throat> um what you can do i'm actually going to provide a, an example of this in the performance uh one of the performance videos um you can essentially batch so if you had like a thousand items that you need to just render or ten thousand you can basically chop the array up into thousands or hundreds um assigns this dot my collection equals and then the first chunk of the array set a timeout um do the other one and just batch it basically that's that's like a decent way of um rendering huge amount of uh dom nodes uh hi i have just entered now you're like eight to two minutes late <laughs> uh, da, da, da. How would you manage too many Angular 1 digest cycle calls being made in an enterprise app which consists of different features developed by different teams? Oh my. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how the, the app's architected or whichever, but you can basically do like a, the root scope digest checker. I'll post the link um, and then you can basically s paste it in each module if you've split it up into modules and see where um, they're coming from. Is there any point to continue with Angular 1? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wouldn't be like still speaking about Angular 1 and doing that all these kind of things if I thought it was going away. Um, otherwise, it'd be a complete waste of time. Um, I think it's probably the biggest online framework. Um, and it's been around since 2009, which if you think the amount of applications that are built using Angular that need upgrading, and now we've got this new like 1.5 component architecture, data flows completely changed. Um, that need to be one upgraded to like new like, ways of doing things like two way data binding isn't really encouraged anymore. Um, NG model is the only thing that you should really do two way data binding with um, in Angular now, even like what Angular one and Angular two. Um, everything else should really just be one way data flow, one way data binding. And then you just pass things back up via events. If you've used um, a React at all, then that's like a similar concept. Right, Todd. I'm just gonna. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna just end the broadcast. But um, Cy from Crowdcast is in here, and he just said that you can carry on using the text chat. Will just continue to work. So if you okay. do answer any final questions on there, that's probably the best way of uh, doing it. He says it will work fine. So yeah. Um, but I'll just bring this to like a more formal end now, and then yeah, anyone who wants to stay in feel free to do so.
so yeah, yeah thanks yeah. for coming it's been really good man um, the reaction's been really good um and uh yeah everyone's been great so uh, thanks for attending as well if uh, you're one of our lovely attendees oh man there's so many questions <laughs> well well i'll stop the broadcast and then you can uh, answer in text form yeah i'll um if everyone could just post them in the big feed then i'll answer on them all if they're not duplicates um, you know. cool it's gonna be then, great having you on man yeah um what i'm gonna um i'm basically had to leave my house because my network crashed <laughs> yesterday um so i'm gonna basically drive home right because it's like 8 30 and then yeah. i will pick up some questions later on so if, if i go blank everyone for like a couple of hours then um that's why um Thank you, everyone who's posting thanks. Yeah, but dedicated people will, will, will keep coming back. And if not, they can always follow you at Todd Motto as well. Yeah, and if I forget your question, then tweet me and irritate me. <laughs> I always get thanks a lot of questions. Folks. Cool, thanks, everyone. Thanks, man.